Hello, and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver, and I'm a scientist, and out of camera shot at the moment is Cindy Oliver, and she's a dog. Most likely you'll see her at some stage during this video. Now, this is a video that I really wish I didn't have to make, particularly given I had a completely different video planned. However, a number of people have drawn my attention to a new video by Dr. John Campbell that completely misrepresents a study out of Singapore and suggests that children aged 5 to 11 are worse off getting vaccinated for COVID than not. Needless to say, this is completely false. But before we look at what Dr. Campbell has to say, let's go back to the science and have a look at the study paper. This is the paper. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the 20th of July, 2022. And it shows unequivocally the benefits of vaccinating children aged 5 to 11 years. This table here shows the key findings. And the most important finding you can see in the bottom right-hand corner of the table. And that is that there was an 82.7% reduction in hospitalizations for COVID amongst those children who were fully vaccinated compared with those who were unvaccinated. Another important figure is the 65.3% reduction in PCR confirmed cases. This is important because PCR testing in Singapore was only performed on children who had symptoms for more than five days or had coexisting conditions. Other children only had confirmation by rapid antigen testing. So those who had PCR confirmed disease had more serious disease. So how has Dr. Campbell managed to spin this into a video suggesting that children shouldn't be vaccinated? Let's have a look. Yes, you can have a look too. The risk-benefit analysis of vaccination has changed in Omicron times. So today I want to look at a study from Singapore, over a quarter of a million children. Now, in this group of children, 22 of the children suffered a severe adverse reaction to the vaccination. But in the same time period, although there's quite a few children admitted to hospital, only five children needed uh, oxygen. And of that five, only four were admitted to intensive care. So we've got five children needing vaccination out of this large group, but 22 children suffering um, a significant adverse reaction. Now, there is so much false information in this short clip. I'm really not sure where to start. But I guess I'll have to start somewhere. So I'll start with Dr. Campbell's claim that there were 22 serious adverse events caused by the vaccine. The 22 figure is referenced to this report here, which comes from the Health Science Authority in Singapore. And it's their equivalent of the VAERS system in the US, the yellow card scheme in the UK, or the TGA in Australia. And if you've been watching my channel for a while, you probably already know why the report doesn't in fact show there were 22 serious adverse events caused by the vaccine. As the report makes abundantly clear, an adverse event is any untoward medical occurrence in a patient-administered pharmaceutical product, including vaccines, but does not necessarily have a causal relationship with this treatment slash vaccination. And that's a direct quote from the report. And if that isn't enough, they also state the following. It is important to note that the AEs reported do not necessarily mean that the vaccine has caused these AEs, as they may be related to an underlying or undiagnosed disease or the natural progression of an underlying disease. It may be coincidental that the event occurred around the same time when the vaccine was given, but is not caused by the vaccine. As I explained in my previous video on vaccines being the leading cause of coincidence, 
health authorities compare the incidence of adverse events occurring after vaccination with the background rate in the population to determine if an adverse event is likely to have been caused by the vaccine or if it's more likely to just be a coincidence. And we know that myocarditis has been shown to be associated with mRNA vaccines from this analysis. So how many of the 22 serious adverse events that occurred after vaccination were myocarditis? One. And this is another quote from the report. One case of myocarditis was reported in the 5 to 11 age group and the patient recovered well and was discharged from the hospital within a day. So Dr. Campbell has made the classic mistake of confusing adverse events occurring sometime after vaccination with adverse events caused by vaccination, which is quite strange because in videos he made early in the pandemic, he knew the difference. But that's not the only mistake he has made. He claims that these events occurred in the study population, but that's also not necessarily true. The adverse events are based on everyone who got the vaccine in Singapore. But as you can see in this flowchart, not all of these children were included in the study. Over 14,000 children were excluded from the study because they didn't meet the criteria. Okay, so the 22 serious adverse events number is bogus. But let's assume for the sake of argument that the number is valid. Does it make sense to compare this number with the five children who required oxygen after being hospitalised? You may recall I previously made a video about a dodgy preprint paper where they had made apples to oranges comparisons. Well, Dr. Campbell has done a similar thing, except what he has done is more like comparing apples with dinosaurs. And this is a baby dinosaur. You can tell because it has a high-pitched voice. Now, there are two reasons why this comparison is ridiculous. Firstly, for this to be a valid comparison, serious adverse events should also only be adverse events that required both hospitalisation and supplemental oxygen. Was that the definition of serious adverse events? This is the definition of an adverse event as used in the report from the Health Sciences Authority in Singapore. An adverse event is classified as serious when the event resulted in hospitalisation slash extended stay in hospital or resulted in a significant reduction in functioning level slash disability or resulted in a life-threatening illness, e.g. anaphylaxis or death, or resulted in birth defects or is a medically important event. So you don't necessarily even need to be hospitalised, let alone require supplemental oxygen as well as hospitalisation. The other major issue which makes it an apples to dinosaurs comparison is that whereas there were over 200,000 children who were either fully or partially vaccinated during the study period, only 16,909 children who were unvaccinated got COVID during the study because, of course, not everyone is going to be exposed during a period of two and a half months. So the size of the group who could potentially suffer from a serious adverse event was more than tenfold larger than the group that could potentially require both hospitalisation and supplemental oxygen. Now, again, for the sake of argument, let's assume Dr. Campbell's bogus claim that there were 22 serious adverse events caused by the vaccine is correct. A more relevant comparison would be to compare the rate of 
serious adverse events with the hospitalisation rate in the unvaccinated who had caught COVID. Dr. Campbell has very helpfully converted the serious adverse events into a rate per 100,000 doses. So we need to add that up. Uh, in Singapore, as I've said, 22%, uh, 22 sorry, serious adverse uh, events. That's 0.005% of all doses administered. That's <laughs> no, let's, let's cut, to, cut to the quick here. It's five in 100,000. Now, it's important to know that this is the rate per 100,000 doses, and the majority of people would have got two doses. So the rate per person will be higher. But what is a hospitalisation rate amongst the unvaccinated children who got COVID? There were 146 hospitalisations amongst the 16,909 confirmed cases. And this equates to 863 per 100,000. So about 100 times more unvaccinated children will be hospitalised if they get COVID than children who suffer a serious adverse event after getting the vaccine, which may or may not actually be caused by the vaccine. Regarding hospitalisations, Dr Campbell does his best to minimise them and suggest they are no big deal if you don't require oxygen. No one is trying to minimise uh, 288 hospitalizations in this uh, th these group of children. It's a lot, but remember, only five uh, needed oxygen. So a lot are being admitted uh, on a precautionary basis, and we do this with children. We admit children much more readily than adults. At least I've always tended to do that because it's it's we just don't take any chances with children. They're, they're... Now, for a nurse like Dr. Campbell, I am sure admitting children to hospital is no big deal. But that doesn't mean it isn't a big deal for the child. Here's a perspective from someone who was hospitalised as a child. Having been in hospital for a total of around 311 days in my life prior to the age of 21, most of it spent not needing oxygen, I'd like to point out that if I could have just gotten the shot that kept me out for even a day, I would have pretty much done anything for it. I've also spoken to a number of my friends who have had children who have been hospitalised and it's no walk in the park for the parents either. And furthermore, a number of serious conditions resulting from COVID don't necessarily require oxygen for treatment, but this doesn't mean they are not severe. An obvious example is multi-system inflammatory syndrome, or MIS-C as it is known. This was seen in this study, although the total number of cases was low. Six children had MIS-C during the study period, of which four were unvaccinated, one was partially vaccinated, and one was fully vaccinated. Another thing which is briefly mentioned in the manuscript, which Dr. Campbell doesn't cover is long COVID. Now, to be honest, the research on long COVID is a bit of a dog's breakfast. There is no agreed upon definition as to what constitutes long COVID, both in terms of symptoms and in how long is considered long. And this means the reported incidences in children vary quite a bit. But one thing is clear, and that is there are a uh, large number of children suffering from long COVID and they shouldn't be ignored. This is one of many papers looking at long COVID in children and it's just been published in JAMA Network Open. What they looked at in this paper was children who had presented to emergency departments with COVID symptoms and whether they were completely recovered 90 days later. This paper is interesting for two reasons. Firstly, out of 1,844 children presenting to emergency departments for which follow-up data was available, only 447 were hospitalised, which means Dr Campbell's claim that children are just hospitalised as a precaution isn't entirely correct because if it was, 
all the children presenting at the emergency department would have been hospitalised. The other important finding was that the percentage of children who were still experiencing symptoms at 90 days was 9.8% amongst those who were hospitalised and 4.6% amongst those who weren't. It was also more prevalent amongst older children, but it still occurred in younger children. So being hospitalised for COVID can have repercussions that last much longer than the hospitalisation. And of course, there is something much worse than hospitalisation that can happen when you get COVID, and that is you can die. Thankfully, the death rate is much lower in children than what it is in adults, and no deaths were seen during the study period. But low deaths doesn't mean no deaths, and some children do die from COVID. In fact, in the USA, there have been 429 deaths from COVID in children aged 5 to 11 since the start of the pandemic. And as you can see from the figure, there has also been a large number of deaths in other child age groups. And despite some people claiming that Omicron is mild, children are still dying of COVID. There have been 330 deaths amongst children in the US so far this year. Of course, these numbers are much lower than what we see amongst adults, particularly older adults, but the number of acceptable deaths amongst children should be zero. Children should not die for any reason. As I said at the beginning of this video, I really wish I didn't have to make it. In fact, I wish I didn't have to make videos debunking misinformation at all. It would be so much nicer to just make videos communicating science. And I would also get much less abuse. But unfortunately, spreading misinformation has consequences. And so it needs to be called out so that its damage can be minimised. Dr. Campbell's misinformation is particularly dangerous because he was once a source of fairly good information. And because of this, a lot of people trust him. And a lot of people following him just don't have the expertise to realise that he is now spreading misinformation. If you'd like to look further into the data that I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. If you found this video useful, please hit the like button so that YouTube will share it with more people. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button.